The Secret Code for Cheating Mark and Sandra entered the bustling restaurant, looking around the room expectantly. They couldn't wait to be reunited with their families for their long-awaited dinner. As they entered, they noticed Paul and Lucy, Sandra's children, sitting in a quiet and private booth with Lizzie, Mark's daughter. Assuming that their spouses must have stepped away for a while, or were running late, they approached the table with smiles, unaware of the unexpected conversation that awaited them. Mark slid smoothly into the booth, pulled out a chair, and made himself comfortable. Sandra followed suit, her gaze taking a cursory look at her surroundings before joining him. Ignoring the unusual circumstances, they took their seats, ready to enjoy a joyous evening together, completely unaware of the shocking revelation about to take place. Mark pulled out a chair and plopped into the booth, greeting the group with a cheerful, hi, kids. Sandra, looking around the restaurant, followed suit and pulled out her own chair before asking, where are Jim and Sarah? Paul stepped in, explaining, we asked them to give us some time alone with you. Sandra's smile grew wider. Is there any big news? I think we should be honored that you wanted to tell us first, Lizzie replied with a serious expression. I think it was more because we wanted to share something we'd learned. Mark, noticing the change in tone, asked worriedly, you all sound so serious. What's going on? Is everything okay? His gaze shifted to his daughter. Lizzie was silent. Lucy, seemingly unperturbed by the seriousness of the conversation, said, turning to Sandra, her mother, pineapple fudge, a lump caught in Sandra's throat, rendering her speechless for a moment. Her face paled, becoming like a ghostly sheet as she tried to comprehend the unfolding conversation. Mark, utterly confused by the sudden turn of events, replied with a puzzled expression and confusion clearly audible in his voice. Pineapple fudge? What are you talking about? Lizzie, taking the opportunity to make light of the situation, turned to her father with a leading question. Good question, Daddy. Sandra, do you want to explain it to him? Lucy, Sandra's daughter, intervened again, adding a touch of sarcasm to her words. Yes, Mom. You don't want to explain to my biological father what pineapple fudge means? Sandra, fighting the shock of being confronted with such a revelation, muttered, trying to gather her thoughts. Yep. Expecting. How did you, where did you hear about pineapple fudge? Paul, maintaining a nonchalant look, intervened, making light of it with a tinge of accusation in his voice. From your diaries, of course. Where you write everything down, right? That's your secret code for, Today I had an affair with a man who was not my husband but is considered his best friend, isn't it? His gaze shifted from his mother to Mark and back again. Indignation reflected in his eyes, not really hidden by his voice. Lucy, feeling the weight of this revelation, expressed a bittersweet feeling. I always wished I had an older sister. Saying this, she discreetly squeezed Paul's hand, which she held under the table. Her gaze shifted to Lizzie, and she added with genuine tenderness, and I've known and loved Lizzie all my life. Also squeezing Lizzie's hand gently, but then her tone changed, filled with contempt as she turned her attention to Mark. But it's still a little shocking to hear that we share a biological father, the gravity of her words hung in the air, emphasizing the deep sense of betrayal and resentment she felt towards Mark and Sandra, whose actions had destroyed the foundation and trust of both families. Paul, with a mixture of annoyance and frustration audible in his voice, spoke the truth that had finally come out to Mark. Did you really think we'd never find out? In a world of DNA testing, genetic diseases, and pedigree studies, it's pretty clear that sooner or later it's going to come out. Mark was silent for a moment, realizing the gravity of Paul's words before switching to a defensive tone. Look, guys, we're sorry you had to find out about this, but it doesn't have to change anything. Lucy, Paul, I'm still the same Uncle Mark you've known all your lives. His attempt to reassure them seemed weak in the face of shaken confidence. Continuing his explanation, Mark pleaded, Jim and Sarah don't need to know about this. It will only hurt them and do them no good. In his eagerness to protect the stability of life, Mark failed to feel the profound impact this revelation had already had on their family dynamics. Jim's voice broke through the tension, hitting Mark and Sandra as they realized their missing partners had approached the table unnoticed. 
A little late for that, old friend. You're about three months late. Jim pulled out a chair and sat down. The gravity of his words hung in the air, emphasizing the depth of the betrayal. Sarah joined them at the table, anger and disappointment reflected on her face. Besides, Jim found out first and told me before we jointly decided to tell the children. She sat down and you could feel the restrained fury in her movements. You could hear the simmering anger in her voice as she directly addressed Sandra. Sarah's words were punctuated with sharp acrimony. And now, after our weekend with Jim, I really don't think no benefit is a sufficient assessment. She smirked at Sandra. There was a mixture of indignation and derision on Sarah's face. Sandra, I can't understand what was going on in your poor head. You traded a Michelin-starred chocolate ganache for a stale, dried-up piece of pineapple fudge? I'm glad the kids insisted on the extra time, because I could barely walk here from our hotel room. Mark's shock was quickly replaced by anger as he realized the truth. His voice shook with a mixture of disbelief and indignation. Wait, you and Jim, you're having an affair. Lucy, though angry, couldn't resist chuckling bitterly at the irony of Mark's reaction. Are you really upset about this? Aren't you being a little hypocritical? A slight sarcasm could be heard in her words, emphasizing the double standard. Sandra, whose composure was gradually returning, intervened in a calm but determined tone. Wait, wait, wait. If you two were together, then we're even. Jim, you've had your revenge. She met the accusing glances of her children and husband. Now we have to figure out how to move forward and work to rebuild both of our families. A glimmer of determination appeared in her eyes as she took the lead. Sandra's voice grew stronger as she continued. Determination guiding her words. This doesn't have to change anything. Mark and I will end our affair, and you both will end yours. We can all get over it. There was conviction in those words, as if she was determined to pave the way for healing and restoration in the face of broken trust. A mixture of shock and intense anger flashed in Jim's eyes as he listened to Sandra's attempt to level the playing field. His voice used bitterness as he replied, well, that may seem fair to some, my dear. It would be if it weren't completely idiotic. He paused, his anger boiling over. The words poured out in a torrent of pain at the betrayal. You've been having an affair with that asshole for 20 years. You conceived a child together and told me it was mine. All this time, Sarah and I have been friends, close friends, but never once have we done anything inappropriate. How the hell does that make us equals? Sandra's puzzlement was evident when she answered, Sarah just told me that you spent the weekend together. Sarah's mocking tone cut through the air as she objected. We did. And it was magical. Honey, it turns out that at our age, not all guys are so lame. She smirked, clearly relishing the opportunity to tease her husband. Lucy playfully interjected, inserting, had Sandra been in a more stable frame of mind, she would have noticed that her daughter had called the other woman mom, but in her confusion, she didn't. She would realize it soon enough. Jim's voice grew firmer as he continued, a tinge of triumph heard in his words. But you're wrong, Sandra. We never had an affair, because by the time I first touched Sarah, we had both already filed formal divorce papers. You were too busy on your weekend business trip for us to bother catering to you, but he raised his hand, pointing to the man standing at the door. The atmosphere became tense. The unknown man reacted to Jim's gesture and approached the table. Wasting no time, he delivered his message in a cold and formal voice. Sandra Davis, Mark Willis, you have been served. He handed each of them a brown envelope of heavy paper, the contents of which were no secret. The man then stepped back, pulling out a camera to capture the moment before nodding to Jim and walking away, leaving the culprit stunned and confused. There was silence around the table as Mark and Sandra exchanged glances. They were feverishly trying to comprehend the sudden turn of events. The gravity of those envelopes was completely life-changing for them, adding another layer of uncertainty to a turbulent situation. Sandra's composure shook. Her voice shook with despair, and tears streamed down her face. I don't want a divorce, 
She this is not the way it was supposed to happen. Mark and I don't love each other. That didn't mean anything. I love you, Jim. I've always loved only you. Her words filled with pain. She pleaded with her husband, hoping to save their broken relationship. Sandra shifted her gaze from Jim to Lucy and Polly, her children, her voice breaking with excitement. Lucy, Polly, tell him. Tell your father that this must not destroy our family. Her pleas went out to her children, hoping they would help bridge the gap between their parents. Mark, who sat silent, seemed utterly broken, his face reflecting the immense pain he was feeling. He seemed lost, unable to find the right words to express the depth of his remorse and regret. In a silent act of solidarity and support, Jim, Sarah, Paul, Lucy, and Lizzie placed their hands on the table, interlacing their fingers. Their united display emphasized their commitment to each other, recognizing the challenges ahead and giving each other the strength and support needed to face the future. Jim's stern voice boomed through the room, drawing attention and signaling that it was time for Sandra to listen. The weight of the decision made by all five of them was clear. Sandra, I think it's time for you to shut up and listen. The five of us have been discussing how to proceed for a month now. We have all our ducks in a row, and as far as I'm concerned, none of it is subject to revision. Lizzie intervened in a decisive tone, confirming the unity of their decision. We have thought long and hard about it individually, and then relied on each other to decide how to proceed. In this we are unanimous. She glanced at Paul and Lucy, honoring their collective efforts. I'll just add that the three of yous came up with this, and your spouses initially tried to talk yous out of it. Paul, speaking with a sense of maturity and determination, emphasized the seriousness of the situation. My little sister may be the youngest at the table, but she is now an adult with a wise head on her shoulders. She has been most directly affected by this, so we asked her to tell you how things will unfold from here on out. Lucy, sniffing her nose but gathering her strength, spoke with a mixture of pain and determination. To make a long story short, it's like this. She turned to Mark, her voice firm and adamant. Mark, you were my donor, but you never were and never will be my father. Her gaze returned to Sandra, her expression darkening. Sandra, you've been my mother my whole life. Not as good a mother as my father was, but my mother nonetheless. Well, that ends tonight. From now on, you and I have no relationship. I don't want to talk to you, read your messages, or have any contact at all. That may change in the future, but I wouldn't bet on it. If it happens, it would be my decision. I'm sure you are against it, but I want none of you to ever contact me again. I can assure you that I will not withdraw. Paul, looking at his broken and almost catatonic mother, shared Lucy's feelings. The same is true of me. Lizzie, determined and adamant, joined her voice. And to me, too. Sarah, calmly but firmly, touched on the practical aspect of their decision. Jim and I share a solicitor, whose details are on those envelopes you hold in your hands. All contact must now be made only through a lawyer. There was an awkward silence at the table as the weight of what had been said was realized. The way forward had been mapped out, and the consequences of their choices would undoubtedly change their lives. Jim, after a meaningful pause, allowed the silence to thicken, giving Sandra and Mark time to realize the gravity of what had been revealed. Breaking the silence, he moved on to the next question. All eight grandparents have been informed of this today, he shifted his gaze to Sandra. Your parents, he nodded, and yours, pointing to Mark, have done nothing wrong, and we don't want to cut them out of their grandchildren's lives. There was a sense of care and consideration in his words, as he had always respected and loved his relatives. Jim continued, emphasizing all the terms. However, their continued involvement depends on their acceptance of the situation. They are not to pass on any messages from you to the children and will not update you on any aspect of our lives. He makes it clear that the boundaries set for Sandra and Mark also apply to their parents. While they may maintain a relationship with you, this should in no way interfere with us or affect our family dynamics. Mark, your mom and dad are eager to get to know their new granddaughter better and we will definitely support Lucy in getting to know them. At the same time, unsurprisingly, 
it makes no difference to my parents. They love Lucy more than anything in the world, and nothing will ever change that. The once unified family structure has been forever altered, and the new boundaries will change the relationship not only between Sandra, Mark, and the children, but also between their parents and grandchildren. Sarah intervened. We're not leaving. This isn't New York or Los Angeles. We might run into each other in a restaurant or on the street. Her tone was filled with anger, a sense of warning, and a clear boundary. With palpable restraint, Sarah continued, determination audible in her voice. I would strongly advise you both to pretend you don't know me. It took all my self-control not to spank you both here tonight. The depth of her anger was evident, and it was clear that maintaining her composure in future confrontations might be a challenge. Then Lizzie's voice took on a more positive, albeit tortured, tone. It was her turn. But in a way, Sandra, you were right. Her words hung in the air, catching the attention of everyone at the table. A noticeable shift occurred when Lizzie addressed Aunt Sandra, abandoning her usual affectionate address and calling her simply Sandra. It was a subtle but significant sign of a strained relationship. She paused briefly before breaking the unexpected news, her tone still permeated with a mixture of emotions. I want to share some good news. Actually, two pieces of good news. Paul and I are getting married, and it's going to happen soon, because in about seven months, your first grandchild will be joining us. For a moment, a spark of joy flashed in Sandra's eyes when she heard this news, but the gravity of the previous discussion quickly cooled it. Likewise, the look of hope on Mark's face wavered as he realized the complex implications of the situation. Paul, pushing aside any positivity, spoke bluntly, his voice filled with a mixture of frustration and determination. Lizzie and I have been talking about how your betrayal has affected our relationship. It's damn strange that we now share a half-sister. But after all, we've been inseparable since the very first day we met at Playgroup. There was a note of bitterness in his words, but also a strong refusal to let their parents' actions ruin the bond between the children. While it will always be overshadowed by the fact that that is where you first met, there is no reason to let your horrible behavior ruin our relationship, Lizzie continued. The baby came out of the blue, and it was earlier than we had originally planned. But we always wanted to have children. There was a sincerity in her words that reflected an underlying desire for stability and love in the midst of chaos. Her voice was gaining strength. Our parents, the two that are left, are very supportive of our decision to start a family now. Lizzie emphasized the support they received from Jim and Sarah, who were by their side at this crucial moment. Their parents' unwavering support provided a glimmer of hope in the midst of all the turmoil, a reminder that there are still foundations of love and care that can be relied upon. But regardless of what you may think about how things will change in the future, know this, Paul said in an unwavering tone, you will not be attending our wedding unless you will not attend the birth of your first grandchild or any subsequent grandchildren. You will not spoil them, play with them, or babysit them to give us a day off. His words painted a picture of severe restrictions. He glanced at Sandra, a mixture of emotions reflected on his face before continuing, you won't get their pictures, you won't hear their first words, and you won't catch them when they fall. The weight of those words was palpable, illustrating the profound loss both sides would experience. He looked at Jim, and appreciation and respect flashed in his eyes. He turned to Sarah, trying a new way of addressing her for the first time. The subtle change in address carried deep meaning, signaling a change in their relationship. Paul's voice softened as he realized the burden that would now fall on Jim and Sarah. Mom and Dad would have to take on the burden of being the only grandparents. Despite the seriousness of the conversation, Sarah couldn't help but smile at the thought of becoming a grandmother and at Paul calling her mom. Striking the final blow, Paul turned to Mark. Mark, you're not walking Lizzie down the aisle. That honor goes to Daddy. Frankly, you've already given up the right to give her away. There was a firm resolve in Jim's voice when he brought up the issue of making this change widely known. Sarah and I have done nothing wrong, and so we have no intention of hiding the reasons for the breakdown of our marriages from friends and acquaintances. Barely audible, Lucy continued, I want people to know. 
I want people to know why I cut you out of my life completely, mom, so that you would be judged harshly, not me. Her desire for others to understand the gravity of the decision reflected her need for approval and appreciation. I don't want you at my graduation next month. Yes, it's a public event, and I can't forbid you from attending. Lucy's voice grew stronger, a mixture of determination and concern for her reputation. But I've earned the respect of my teachers and the parents of my friends, and I don't want to lose that by spitting at you if you show up. Lizzie intervened with a wry smile, bringing a note of humor to the tense atmosphere. Unless, of course, before then, Sandra, your mother still paints you. There was a hint in her words that if Mark and Sandra did not heed what she said, the consequences could be serious and physical. All five rose from their seats, leaving Sandra and Mark alone with their shattered world. One last thing, Jim began firmly, his gaze focused on the cheating ex-spouses. I had a loving friendship with Sarah for 20 years. It wouldn't take much effort to turn that into a loving relationship. He pointed to Sarah, recognizing the depth of their bond. I've already fallen in love with her, simply because of her support over the last three months. He looked directly at Sandra and Mark. Betrayal won't break me, and I won't let it break Sarah. There was a determined defiance in his words, a refusal to give in to the pain he was causing. You may have laughed at us behind our backs for the last 20 years, but for the next 50 I will laugh with Sarah. He emphasized the joy and happiness that awaited him and Sarah, free from the burden of a broken relationship. Turning to Sarah, Jim softened his tone. Sarah, I've fallen in love with you. It's too soon to expect you to feel the same way, but I want you to give me a chance. There was a plea in his words, a plea for patience and a chance to build something new. And when you do, Jim continued, his voice getting stronger, I want us to commit our future to each other before God and our children. Our partners didn't seem to take their vows seriously, but we didn't change them, and we can be sure that our attitude toward our future vows will be just as deep and heartfelt. When Jim first spoke to Sarah, it may well have been too soon for Sarah to have the same deep feelings for him that he had for her. But looking at her tearful smile, it was obvious to anyone that by now she was feeling the same way. Jim and Sarah, hugging each other, followed their three children out the door. United and ready to forge a new path together, guided by love and determination, to find happiness amidst the ruins. Sandra and Mark were left to deal with the consequences of their actions. The End